so we're in a in the session two right now, and you know we just got through with football season, Super Bowl. Some of us hung out and did that, um, but now we are now you know without football. And just so you know, there's 187 days until the college football is back. Uh, that's my favorite part. But out of that, you know, I'll try to not use too many football illustrations from here till then. You know, I've got 187 days to wait, but I wanted to share um, one story, and it's, uh, some of you won't like it because it happens to involve some Alabama players, but Bear Bryant uh, was the coach at Alabama, and Gene Stallings actually played for him, was an assistant coach for him, and then he went on to coach Alabama. And he tells the story of when he was just an assistant coach with Coach Bear Bryant, he was out recruiting, and Coach uh, Bear saw him, and so he called him into his office, and he said, Stallings, I wanted to make sure you knew the kind of young man we want to recruit here at Alabama. He says, okay, Coach, tell me. And he said, well, first off, I want to tell you about myself. You know, when I was in high school, I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the strongest, but I had heart. And one day, our coach pulled us outside on a rainy day, and there was a big muddy pit, and he drew a big circle, and he picked the biggest, meanest strongest lineman, put him in the circle, and he says, who will line up against him? And Coach Barry Bryant said, I was an underclassman and undersized, but I said, I will coach, and I got him lined up. He blew that whistle, and I hit him as hard as I possibly could, and he put me face down. He said, knock the wind out of me. I thought I blacked out, didn't know what was going on. I got back up. You know what? I got back in that circle, and I said, let's do it again, Coach. Coach just shook his head. Said, okay, and he blew the whistle again. This, he said, this time I launched at him with everything I had in me. And he put me on the ground again. This time he put me so hard in the ground, my face mask, the mud was coming through my face mask. I didn't know what to do, but I wasn't going to give up. I got up, cleaned the mud out, got up again, said, let's do it again, coach. Coach said, that's enough, Bryant. We'll, we'll call it for the day. And he said, uh, Stallings, so now do you understand the kind of man we want at Alabama? He said, I think I do, coach. He said, well, tell me. He said, you want the guy with heart. You want the guy that, you know, no matter how many times he gets knocked down, he gets back up. And Coach Bear Bryant said, no, Stallings. I want you to find the biggest, meanest, ugliest dudes that will keep knocking you down no matter how much heart you have. Uh, and uh, the reason I share that story is today we're in session two. We're talking about looking back, and we're looking back at our past. And for some of us, this might be a little bit like getting in that circle against one of the hardest opponents we've ever had to face because we have to deal with our past, and maybe we've never dealt with our past. And we're not here to sing kumbaya and and hug and cry it out, but at the same time, it's really important that we look back so we know where we're going. So we're going to jump into that uh, tonight as we we get into this. Um, You know, I've had to look back at my life. I've shared this story before in men's fraternity. I had to share this on Wednesday, and I'll tell you, Wednesday kind of knocked me down. It's been a long time since I had to process and things have changed. I have small kids. I have a foster teenager now. Uh, we've moved back home, and there's a lot to that uh, in my story. And I'm going to share part of my story tonight. I can't ask you to do something that I can't do myself. And so one of the things tonight is to model that and invite you to do that with your group at a later time. So as we get into this, you know, you see on looking back, page 15, we're looking at the, the last week we looked at key elements shaping our manhood today, and one was the challenges of our modern world. You've got the loss of a common manhood vision. Like, can it be defined when it seems like it's changing every day, and it's really hard to hit a moving target? We, we, we like to know what the goal is. Like, what does it mean to be a man so I can hit the target, so I can win at this? And then they seem to keep moving the definition. That can be frustrating. Then the idea of a weightless manhood, that's the idea of an absent dad or a fatherless home. And when, when, with Dad just provides that weight, that stability, that strength that helps guide us in those times where we need to know what we need to know. Then we've got the changing social landscape. I mean, changing of definition of marriage for the first time in 4,000 years, decline in marriage as a whole. And finally, the big one, lies men believe about themselves. Things like, I should know what to do. Growing up thinking, I should know how to treat my wife. I should know how to handle finances. I should know what to do because I'm a man. And... uh, or things like, if I tell you the truth, uh, you will reject me. And uh, when, we, when we look at these ideas here, uh, many men have never taken the time to look back at their 
past. And that's the challenge of our past. And that's the first part of this uh, when we look at this on page 15. Uh, Many men have never taken the time to connect the dots, it says, between their past and their present. I like the way it says this, that explains why they are the way they are um, and why they feel the way they feel. There are things that we feel and we process simply because of our past, and if we've never understood it, we don't even know why we're like that. But um, you can see a quote from Socrates, an unexamined life is not worth living. But he goes on to say, it could be said an unexamined manhood is hard to live with. It's not just us that this affects. It affects those around us, our emotions. And so you see on the next page, you might get asked by your wife or a friend, you know, why do you get so angry like that? Why do you blow up at these things like that? Or why can't you share your feelings with me? Or what makes you act this way? Why do you work all the time? There's all kinds of things that we might be doing based on the past in this. And so many men have no answers, even for themselves. So as you get into that, you know, a lot of guys think, well, I'm fine. I can handle this. You know, I, I can do it on my own. And the truth is, maybe you can handle it, but the people around you may not can handle it because it might be bleeding out on our relationships around us. That's why it's important to do this. And so instead, minimizing or ignoring the impact of our past often undermines uh, or our present. We can minimize. We can quickly just go, you know, I don't need to deal with that. You know, I had some stuff in the past. Uh, I don't need to talk about it. I can live with it. But it might be affecting us in so other ways. And so one of the things that we're going to do is encourage you to share your story in your small group. And I've already, uh, we did this on Wednesday and I invited groups to do this, and I've already had feedback from one group that did it, and there were some breakthroughs in the group. Like, they didn't want to do it any more than we do, okay? They, they, you know, they've never shared their story with a group of men, for sure, or their whole story, and um, they talked about the breakthrough. Then we had our group. We met this afternoon. Our, our Wednesday group met, and there were breakthroughs in that. One mentioned, I have had anxiety ever since you mentioned this. Like, I have never had to share any of this, but to watch what the bond, there was a bonding experience, like we feel connected in a way, like we're in this together, we're moving forward, and, um, and I'll just tell you, last Wednesday, I didn't want to do this, uh, and I definitely didn't want to do it tonight, because it's on YouTube uh, by the end of the week, but um, I've shared my story in the past, but that was in Tennessee, and that was before streaming, and um, my dad and his effect on my family's life and in this community Um, it's a little different when you know who my dad was, made him know my dad, or you know my mom, or you know my family. It hits a little closer to home because there's some shame in that. And so I really struggled with that this week. Um, I struggled with a lot of this, uh, and maybe that's something that you have to do as well. If you haven't processed your story in a while, we'll talk about that. Things change over time. It's important to look back once you become a dad. I mean, that changes some of the things that you experienced growing up, for instance. So I'm going to share a little of my story. You see a a layout here that we're going to encourage you to look at when you do this. Um, But my family consisted of, uh, let me see if I need to put this on a different slide. Everybody has a story. So my family consisted of my dad, my mom, and my older sister who was nine years older than me. Uh, My dad at this point was already a pastor, That was not his past, but he had come to know Christ, radically saved after a a very different lifestyle before that. Um, So he was a preacher. He was at Cherry Creek. Uh, Well, actually, I was born at Toxas Baptist. Then he moved pretty quickly to to Cherry Creek Baptist. And that's where I grew up uh, the first couple of years of my life. That's my first memories where I learned how to climb a tree, things like that. was in that front yard right there at Cherry Creek where the pastorum is. And uh, I just thought my dad was awesome. You know, he was my hero. He, he was up there on Sundays. Everybody loved him. And outside, everybody did love him. But when I go back and look more a little bit about that, I realized there's some things um, I didn't understand at the time. One thing is it radically changed my personality. Um, I was the bubbly, never met a stranger, just like I am now, just kind of like I enjoy being around people. But pretty soon I learned that whenever we went out in public, I looked for the first chair to sit at at any party or any fellowship we went to. All the other kids would go and play, but I knew that if I messed up, all of a sudden he'd be yanking on my arm. There was no warning, and there was a whooping coming. And not just any kind of whooping. The, um, 
they were pretty harsh from what I hear. I don't remember them. That's the part that uh, makes it interesting about my childhood. I don't remember a lot of my childhood. And so uh, Amy and I was in, a, it's called Trauma Informed Parenting. It was just a couple of years ago in foster care. We were going through this course and we we're just sitting there. And this person was teaching about the effects of trauma in early childhood. And she started listing things like anger and loss of memory in childhood. And she just listed my life like to a T. And I just remember looking at Amy and she's looking at me like we knew, oh, that explains a lot for me. And um, I've never gone in and tried to dig up everything in there. I just know that when he disciplined me, it was in anger. And I have always tried to not whip my kids. I shouldn't have said that on YouTube. Discipline my kid. I wonder if I can edit. I'll, I'll, let me see if I can get it. I have always tried to never uh, discipline my kids in anger because it can be harsh. And so that's something that I learned from that. Um, I do have some memories, though, from that time. For one thing, um, I remember my first day of kindergarten. I came home to Kitty Land. Um, Miss Pat Russell from our church was one of our teachers. Miss Allen was another lady, and the smell of pine saw takes me back there every time because that's what that whole house smelled like. But I came home the first day of Kitty, Kitty Land, and I said, Mama, I saw the prettiest girl today. She had the prettiest blonde hair, and I did this. She tells me that part of the story. And my mom said, well, what color are her eyes? And if you know me, I'm not a detailed person. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And so the next day I come home from school, and I said, they're blue. My mom's like, what are blue? You know, 24 hours has passed for her, and I said, her eyes, and that was Amy, and I literally was in love with her from first sight. It took me 15 years to talk her into marrying me, and we were off again, on again, all through high school, even in college and things like that, but I will say that one of the things that affected in my life is um, there's a lot of things I could have gotten into, um, and and I'll share more about that. I was a latchkey kid. Mom worked tax season. By this time, my dad was gone. I could have done whatever I wanted, but I knew Amy had certain standards about who she was going to marry, and that kept me from a lot of trouble. Uh, that, that was really something I've learned that in my life that that vision of what I want to be at has helped guide me from doing something, certain stupid things in my life and helped guide me in that. So, so back to my childhood, uh, there was something else that was going on with my dad. You know, everybody loved my dad, but one of the reasons for that was he was so focused on pleasing everyone. You see, he was a pastor, and no matter what you needed, he was going to give it to you, even at the expense of his family. Uh, There's this idea of when you talk about your priorities in your life, most will tell you it should be God first, then your family, then work, okay? Because if you take care of the God thing, you don't neglect your family because you're called to lay down your life for your family. But a lot of times, here's the problem. When you're a pastor, God and work, the lines get blurred and the kids and the family get squished in the middle of this sandwich of like, how do you balance that? Well, my dad had no balance on that. And I do have one of my other memories from childhood. Oh, I actually have two. I'll tell you this one. He was going to whoop me one day, and I got away. And I was at the Cherry Creek Pastor. Every time I drive by it, I think about this. I ran laps around that house all the way outside. He couldn't catch me. He'd had too many heart attacks by then. And uh, I was like, don't whoop me, Daddy. Don't whoop me, Daddy. And he finally said, I won't whoop you, son. So I came up. He gave me a hug, and then he whooped me with that belt from the Holy Land, the Jerusalem belt that he used. So there's some trust issues there, I'm sure. But, uh, no, the one I do remember is one Saturday morning, I'm in my amazing Spider-Man pajamas. It's Saturday morning. It's cartoon time. It's the 80s. It's the only time. There's no such thing as a VCR in my world. This is the only way I'm going to get to watch this episode of Spider-Man. And my dad, somebody called, wanted to get married, and he decided to marry them in our living room. And I hated that moment. Now, it sounds trivial, but when you're six years old, your dad chooses to do anything other than what the family, like, they could have married him under a tree. I've married people under a tree. Like, I know you can do it, and instead he chose to do it in the living room, and I just remember that, and I remember thinking, I never want to treat my kids like this. I never want my kids to get sacrificed trying to please other people, and I just remember that moment, and feeling betrayed, angry. I don't know what to explain. You know, one of the goals of this is when you tell your story is not just to give the fact, but how you felt. Those moments when you felt pride, those moments when you felt shame or betrayal or humiliation, um, those are the things that we process what was going on because that affects those triggers in our life today. And so the good moments, I can honestly say I don't remember good moments as a whole because I don't have a lot of memories. Um, 
I remember us playing on an Atari. We got an Atari, one of the first ones to have an Atari. I remember us playing games as a family. I did get a whooping one time for throwing down the controller after getting killed on Frogger or something. I do remember that. And so a lot of my life memories revolves around certain whoopings. Um, but out of that, we got a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo. I got into games. I played video games all through high school. That was my outlet. That was what got me into computer science because I had to figure out how to make my computer run the newest games, and I learned how to fix computers, and that got me into computer science. And so that was the start of something um, because all in during that time, my dad, I didn't know his past at this point, but when I was eight years old, my dad uh, had been counseling a couple, and the wife called on a Saturday and said, I need help. He goes to her house. He says, what is it? She kissed him on the, in the front yard, flew all over him. He promptly resigned from the church, left us, and ran off with her to Memphis on a Saturday night. Um, he was too afraid of God to get in the pulpit, knowing what he decided. Like, when he cut it clean, he cut it clean uh, through that. And uh, that next morning, um, I got up, and my mom was there, and she's just hurting, and I don't know it. And she's watching Adrian Rogers on Sunday morning before we go to church. And I got up and I said, Mama, who do you think's a better preacher, Daddy or Adrian Rogers? I think Daddy is. And what I didn't know is my mom's dying on the inside. He just left us the night before. And this was not during tax season. And my mom was a tax preparer for from January to April. She made all her money for the whole year. And uh, it wasn't during that time. So we had no money. And she started working for Junior Robbins in a factory behind his house on QT Todd Road. All through that winter, I remember she worked her hands to the bone to, to this day. It affected her from working out there, but she did whatever it took to take care of us. Um, Dad was just out of the picture for a while. And, um, you know, once tax season hit especially, I mean, my mom was gone. And this was the 80s. You just, you just go home. You ride the bus home and you do whatever you want to do. Um, during those years... You know, I had friends that brought things over. I saw pornography uh, by this time, you know, in the teen years. That was something that I had to deal with. I was one of the first ones on the internet in town. And I remember what it was like when you got on the internet for the first time, and you're like, there's no search engines yet. There was this thing called web crawler, but it, you didn't know how to use it. And so you're like, what do you do? Ford.com. Oh, there's a Ford website. Chevrolet.com. You know, Disney.com. You can find these things. Finally, you go, Playboy.com. You know, and it would say, are you 18? Yes or no? That's what I remember. This was the early wild west of the internet. And if you said, yes, I'm 18, welcome to the world of porn. If you said no, took you to Disney.com. True story. Um, So there was a a whole new world to me that I had to deal with, the addiction to that, that I had to work through, you know, thinking marriage will fix that later on in life. Marriage doesn't fix those problems. There's other issues. And so that's part of my past history and awareness. And so in high school, I, I pursued basketball because my dad was big into basketball. I wanted to, to, to really connect with him through that. We reconnected. I started getting to visit him on the weekends, sometime through high school years, ninth grade, eighth grade, somewhere through there. And then in my 10th or 11th grade year, he died of a heart attack. He was actually at a horse pulling in Oklahoma, uh, doing what he loved. And um, I think one of the hard parts about telling this story is since I've been back, I, I've met a man. Um, that was with him when he, when he collapsed. And I know that that's what he said last was, well, if I die, tell him I die doing what I love, you know? Um, as a son, you wished he loved you enough that he would have spent that time with you, but he was always on to the next thing, and that horse pulling made him so nervous that he literally had a heart attack and died. And um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Talking about defining moments, I wouldn't wish that, you know, if you've been that son that's been at your father's funeral, you know how that impacts your life. I remember I went home, and I had a friend at the house, and I took my basketball because I had devoted so much time to basketball because I wanted my dad to be proud of me. I just kicked it as far as I could into the pasture because, like, that was why I was so driven for that for so long. Um, I was angry. I looked for a reason to get mad because I thought that would make me play harder. I burned a lot of bridges. I was a jerk about it. Um, That was the one thing where I got in trouble was when I got competitive, I would say things I shouldn't. I acted a certain way. Um, So that's really a lot of my early years going into. I came to know Christ at the age of nine uh, at a revival at at Ecru Baptist Church. 
And um, I've never had to question that. I've, I've walked through the call to ministry later in life, but um, that was something that was solidified for me uh, at an early age. So off to college, computer science, not understanding that. I was going to go into ministry later, but Amy and I got married at 21. Um, way too young to be doing that, I guess, but, you know, we didn't know any better. We thought we knew what we were doing, and um, before it's over with, that first year, jobs started coming in in my senior year of computer science, uh, jobs out of Memphis, the money was good, and I felt that call to ministry and surrendered to ministry. I was like, couldn't you just let me have one year of that pay? You know, like, just one year, God, you know, that's, that's all I asked for, and he called us to ministry, ended up in New Orleans for three years, Went to seminary there, got to do ministry, got to make some of the best friends in my life. Uh, then we felt the call to church planting. So we moved to Nashville, Tennessee and didn't know a soul and started a church, just the two of us. We ended up with seven churches in two different counties partnering with us during that time. Um, we got to see so many amazing things over those 18 years in Spring Hill. Um, those noble moments, I didn't have any on Wednesday night, couldn't think of any. So I had to ask Amy, I was like, did I? Like, what? What noble moments do we have? But I will tell you that over those years in Tennessee, I got to see marriages restored. I got to walk alongside a lot of men who stepped up. I got to see men who were addicted and cheating on their wife, all of the above, now being in a healthy marriage 10, 15 years later, um, to walk alongside that. These are not the traditional, they would have gotten help at any old church. This was ones that were unique to, to who I was. And Amy said, you need to, you know, to know that. And so um, at the same time, some of those very people I helped were the very ones that walked away and hurt us most deeply while we were there. It really hurt my wife to the point it's hard for her to open up to people because she got stabbed, I and mean, not in the back. It was just on the way out, just you're not enough. You know, that's what you feel. And even when uh, for, for years after that, we were one, at one point running 165 on a Sunday night in July, and in August we were running 85. And nobody went to a church down the street. They left the state. That many people moved in one month, and they all had us over for dinner or took us out to tell us they were moving. To this day, when we were in Tennessee, if somebody called us and said, we want to have you all out for dinner, Amy had to ask, and she would be physically sick until I found out, are you leaving the church? Um, if, if some of the people in this church, uh, some of you have already had that conversation with me because you wanted to have lunch with me pretty early on, the first thing I said, Dan's son, because I know I did it with him, are you leaving the church? I should not be that elevated in my blood pressure. My wife shouldn't be physically sick, but that's where we're at because we went through loving people deeply, and then one day they're just saying, you're not enough, and moving on to another church because not everybody stayed uh, in town. Not everybody left, but um, so there's some wounds from that time. At that same time, I had my daughters. Um, that changed me in a lot of different ways. I realized I couldn't take care of my kids. I got into bushcraft and prepping and all that kind of stuff to where I can make fire with, I don't, I'm not gonna make fire with a stick and another stick. I can make fire with flint and steel, whatever I need to do, make char cloth, all those things. I just wanna be able to purify water, provide shelter if I needed to protect my family because I didn't have any of those skills growing up. I have one, one memory from RAs, that's Royal Ambassadors, that's like baptized Boy Scouts. Uh, and so on Wednesday night at church, you go and you act kind of like a Boy Scout, but you also learn about Jesus and missions and stuff like that. And uh, is that a pretty accurate, uh, Nate? <laughs> and so uh, I went through the book, and I did everything in the book to get the badges. I mean, I did cooking recipes with my mom, everything. And I turned in my book, and I got one pen for participation, and I had three friends that got lots of badges because the men never even checked my book because I didn't have a dad to even do it with. They just assumed... I don't know, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget feeling that way of like, what's the point? And just those missed moments, wishing, where's my dad? Wish my dad would be there. Wish my dad saw me hit the game-winning shot, saw me do those things. Those are those moments that I felt. And even to this day, when you do things that you feel like you wish your dad was there to say, I'm proud of you. You know, I am thankful I had a father-in-law that walked in and has shown me a lot. Um, he showed me that he worked a lot because he had a business of his own, and so I worked with him on that because I was in love with his daughter, so we worked a lot of late nights, but I've watched him, as he retired, take care of his wife and dealing with an illness and love her deeply. So I've gotten to see good examples, too. 
Um, so those defining moments, I don't, I don't know anything other than that. It's just, um, for me, I know I'm called to be a pastor. That's not been in question for a long time. Um, and I've gotten to see God use me in those roles, even when I'm not at church, when I'm at the jujitsu gym or uh, in lots of other places, people tend to just gravitate and start telling me their life story. And the goal is not to give advice, it's just to listen and walk alongside them. So, so that's kind of my story. I'm sure I left some things out. The goal was not to tell you my whole life story, but try to keep it around 15 minutes and kind of share. Now, at the end of this session, you're going to be invited to get with your table leader, and you'll see it on uh, page 21, My Spiritual Life Story, of uh, trying to, in the next seven days or so, or the next week and a half, get with your group and share your stories. 15 minutes or less each. We're not trying to get into all the details. And I know you don't want to do this. I know it feels awkward, but I've already had texts from grown men telling me the breakthroughs they had in their group and how good it was for them and how much they didn't want to do it. I saw it in my own group today. Uh, just there was something about it, okay? They, they really promote this in the group, and they do it kind of early, I feel like. I'm like, whoa, it's just week two. And it's like, let's gather and tell our story, but it changes how I look at the men in my group. I now know a little bit more of why they are the way they are and what they're trying to do. And so um, if you can at all possible, maybe next Sunday afternoon before this meeting, just take an hour, 15 minutes apiece, and share your story. And you can just take that list that I shared with you there, those uh, on page 15, that would be a good way to, to kind of tell that story. Again, you're not just going, you see on page uh, 17, it's not just the facts. How you felt, what you dealt with in that. Um, and what you'll find is your story, um, when you get into it, that was my story. And then we talk about what's your story. And you might think, mine's kind of plain or mine's kind of crazy. Uh, John Ortberg, one author and pastor, wrote a book, Everybody's Normal Till You Get to Know Them. And like, we've all got parts of our story. And what you'll find is sometimes you make a connection with somebody else that dealt with some of the same stuff you dealt with in your own group. You think you're very different. Then you turn out you got more in common. Like we said at the beginning, we have more in common than we realize. Uh, many of us have never shared our full story. Uh, so I'm through of that. I don't know where that went. Hey, that was the wrong page. Uh, many of us never shared our full story on page 17 is that last part of B to fill in. And then we're going to look into the six looking back truths for a minute. Um, some of us don't look back because we don't like to look back. We know there's stuff in the past we don't really want to deal with. But if it's affecting us, even at a, an, a subconscious level, we're not even aware of it. If you're married, you can talk to your wife. They know it. They know what those things are. They just may have not brought it up to you because they know that's hard or something like that. But uh, you'll find those things. But so for the rest of this session, we're going to take just a look of six truths of looking back, okay? Uh, what, what happens when we do this? And the first thing is the examined past is crucial to a better manhood. Uh, without examination, the good from our past can go unappreciated, and the bad can be unconsciously ruling over us. Um, you may not realize, because you've never shared it, what God redeemed in your life. Like, I had not shared the Tennessee part since I moved from Tennessee, and those wounds were different then, or I had not shared my story since I had kids. That changes the parts you remember or what you remember about, oh, yeah, when I was a kid, this happened. I'll never do that in mine. You know, one of the things, I talked about my dad sandwiching work and, and God together. You know, people worry about me being a workaholic. Um, I'm driven, and I don't have a lot of hobbies right now. I've just picked up jujitsu again three days a week at 9 a.m. It's the only time I can go. But before that, you see me here a lot. And they're like, do you ever spend time with your family? Here's the thing people don't see. Every morning, I'm cooking them breakfast. I'm taking them to school. Every night, we're praying together. Every day when they get home from school, about 5 or 5.30, almost every day, except Wednesdays and Sundays, I'm at the house. I'm spending time with them. I'm throwing the ball to one. I'm taking them to violin classes in Oxford, those kind of things. I'm spending a lot of time with my kids and investing in them and investing in Amy because that matters to me. But the rest of the time, I like what I do. I love what I do. <laughs> so you'll see me parked here. And so you also see me parked in the back if you drive down the road because I'm tired of people saying, you stay up here too much. Like that's a, that's a real reality to me. I'm not doing it to prove it to anybody. I didn't know anybody cared. It's just a small town. My own, other churches notice that I'm here a lot, you know, those kind of things. But I'm scared, but here's what I'm noticing. I'm scared they're going to think I'm like my dad. 
that I'm, I'm trying to please somebody. Like, I just love what I do, and I've made it very clear I don't work at home. I used to work in a laptop on the bed, and then you can't remember when you're home and when you're at work, and when you're, you know, like, when you work from home, it's just really hard to know how to turn it off. When I come home, I'm fully present, and that's part of it. So that's why you see, I mean, if it's two in the morning, I can't sleep, and I want to work, I'll show up here and I'll go to work for a little bit. Like that, I'm a night owl. Like that's just who I am. Um, that's not to prove it to anybody else. And so that's a part of me. I'm noticing. I'm I'm a little jumpy on. Don't say that. You know, like I've noticed that that kind of gets me on the defensive. And so again, that's just part of processing this. So examining these things are good for that. Um, uh, number number two B. When a boy fails to connect with his dad, demons of one kind or another often fill the void. Ah. <sighs> And we're really going to talk about this, what happens in a life when you don't have a dad there. Maybe you grew up like me and your dad died or divorced or both in my situation. Um, you, it makes things a little harder because every day you're wondering if they're coming back during the divorce, you know. Is there something I can do? What did I do wrong? You know, we, we, we feed into those lies. So you have those missed moments. Uh, create more missed moments. Um, well, then you got others that say, well, my dad was there, but he wasn't really there. You know, well, he was, he was with me. I shouldn't be like this because I had a dad. Why am I even allowed to feel this way? Other people had it worse. You know, we try to compare ourselves. But you're just a kid dealing with what you're dealing with in those moments. And so it's important to connect the dots. Uh, you, see, uh, you see some of those behaviors, outbursts of anger and violence, workaholism, exploitation of women, acting out, drugs, alcohol, pornography. Um, you know, just go and self-medicate. Try to turn it off, be numb to those things that we're feeling. A lot of that comes into that. Uh, you know, some guys, when you think about it, the enemy comes in and whispers, hey, you don't want to feel like this. I've got something that will take your mind off of it. If you'll just work, you know, let's just let's pour yourself into work so you don't have to think about it. Or you uh, pour yourself into the next toy or, you know, there's always something that the enemy will whisper into us about that. And then others, it's just uh, not processing it means because of denial, we're just completely ignoring it. Like it's obvious, but we're ignoring it. Um, and so there's guys out there still trying to redeem a family name because somebody did something shameful. Um, there's guys that are so driven to be successful so that their dad would be proud of them, even though their dad's already passed on. You know, they're not even aware of it. You've seen these guys trying to get the approval of a dad that's not even around. And maybe that's us, you know. Like, why are we so driven? Why are we like this? And I, I know some of my drivenness comes out of insecurity, you know, because I never felt good enough, never felt good enough compared to everybody else. You know, those kind of moments in my life. But I had to process that to get to that point to be, I'm okay with it now. I just like what I do. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do and those kind of things, but I'm not driven for others' approval or something like that. Um, maybe your siblings, your, your parents love one of your other siblings more than you, so you're always trying to prove it. These are those where those demons come out uh, when we don't connect with dad or others in that same way. Um, so then we get into the next parts. Many men uh, have yet to process the unfinished business from their past and still lives in them. Unfinished business could be unresolved tragedy, family breakup, maybe it's abuse, betrayal. You see all the things right here, uh, any of that, you know. And maybe you see in the notes there, if I was to ask you, do you have any of this in your life? You might go, yeah, if I'm honest with you, you know, I've got some unfinished business because until a man deals with the pain from the past, we see that in the next part, D, he can never be truly free. <laughs> I, uh, I got a little bombshell added to, to my week because I, I, the reason I dreaded this so much is because the shame I feel about what my dad did. It wasn't just that he ran off with another woman. I found out as I got older, his past, before he became a Christian, there were a lot of other relationships. There were things he did in Vietnam. Every picture I have of my dad in Vietnam, he is completely glossy-eyed. I don't know if it was from the whatever kind of beech nut root 
whatever that they were into or drugs or alcohol or whatever it was. But between that and some other things he did over there and, since in, and when he came back, Columbus Air Force Base where he was stationed, Pontotoc County, I got on 23andMe and did my genetics. And now every time it says you have new DNA relatives, my heart skips a little bit because I'm scared I'm going to find a half-brother or sister from Vietnam, Columbia, or Pontotoc. And that's true. You know, I stopped checking it for a few, for a few months. Like, you have new DNA relatives, and I, I checked it this week so I could be honest with you today. But I really don't know. I don't know. And my mom decided to fill me in on some of that. I don't know why she filled me in on it, but she told me some more of that story. And it's, again, just more of the, more of the saying, like, why was my dad that way? Uh, it, it does impact me, and I'm never alone with another female. I'm thankful for the cameras in this building. If uh, somebody has to come here to meet about VBS, we meet somewhere where we can be seen on camera and things like that, but I'm hypervigilant because of my dad. Because that's one of the things that you can do. When you examine your past and you realize the mistakes of your dad don't have to be your mistakes, you can learn from them. Uh, and that's one of the things that comes out of this and dealing with that unfinished business in our life. And so that's when you can be truly free. Those me negative messages that you hear in your head, did anybody ever tell you you're not good enough? Why are you like this, you know? You'll never amount to anything. Some of us have heard those negative messages or felt them, and you can't be free until you can pass it. Uh, e, you cannot effectively address the past or its impact in the present without the help of a few trusted friends. There's no such thing as a self-made man. You know, when you think about it, you can be a self-made success. You can be, you know, you can be wealthy because you're self-made, but as a man, you can never really be self-made unless you have friends. Um, Proverbs 17, you see it right here. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Um, you have to have the iron of another man. You know, my mom tried to raise me right, but there's only so much a mom can do, you know? There's only so much your wife can do as you're, little counselor at night telling you and giving you all that encouragement, but you need men in your life to give you that iron to sharpen one another. And sometimes we need to be the iron for someone. They need to be the iron for us. And so that's, the, it can be a pretty harsh process, but, it, but we both come out better from it as a result of that. And that's why we do the groups. That's why we interact. It's not enough to just get the content. You got to have those other men to walk alongside um, I shared a little bit this morning on Sunday about uh, the faces of manhood, and I don't think it's in this series, but I remember we could use that language. The men in my group, we could say, I saw you put your friend face on today. You know, that was the warrior face. Having that inside language to encourage somebody else, it didn't make sense to anybody else, but we knew what we meant because we've been through this together. Like, there's a difference once you've been through this together and understand that. And so... Uh, F says, for better or worse, we are all significantly shaped by where we come from. But though we are each a product of our past, no one has to be prisoner of the past unless he chooses to be. And look at how you can choose to do that by denying it, ignoring it, or surrendering to it. The good news is you can break free and find a better manhood. So that last point, hold on to this one. For better or worse, you don't have to be a prisoner. We can start today with a new way because some of us say, I've always been like that or that's how my dad was, so that's how I am. My dad had a horrible temper, so I've got that same horrible temper. I broke free from that. That was years. That was 28 years into my life before I broke free from thinking I had to have the same anger issues as my dad. Before I had kids, I'm glad I got through that because that affected my family. But this is always interesting. This part of the better man journey is when you decide whether you're going to stick with this or start finding excuses not to come back. Talking about getting real with one another, sharing your story with another. Uh, we're starting to get into a, some, some hurts in our past. Guys, you can choose to ignore it. You can run from it or you can press in. And I can promise you it's worth it when we do that. And so uh, we're going to discuss the how of breaking free in our next session and so that's what we're going to do uh, next time. So again, before we break into our small groups, and um, that, that page 21 gives you that invitation to meet together. Talk about it as your group. See if there's any way you can make it happen. To somebody who's got a house, just go over, to the, you know, go over to the house. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to even fix some coffee or donuts or any of that stuff. Just gather, 
15 minutes apiece. Hey, let's share our story. It's amazing what you can get done in 15 minutes, but I've already been a part of it, and I saw several breakthroughs just today. That's how, I mean, I wasn't expecting it. I don't know what to expect. I had to share it, and I hated it on Wednesday. I hated it tonight. This isn't because I wanted to share all my guts with you, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good without having to share my guts, but It's a necessary part, and I'm realizing there were some unresolved issues in my past I thought I was dealing with pretty well until I went through it again. And I realized that's why it's important to keep doing these things. So, all right, we're going to break off and enjoy our time together. And when y'all are